So, uh, next up, we've got our third speaker of the evening, just before we have a break, uh, and for some more pasties and Prosecco. Uh, we've got uh, Giz Edwards. Um, and uh, Giz is a content creator for YouTube, focusing primarily on educational videos around the subject of lucid dreaming. And he's the founder of Team Lucid Dream Community. Um, he's also a videographer, focusing on capturing live events in order to better illustrate an organization's story and value. And tonight he is talking about lucid dreaming as a tool to fuel your creativity and how it can help develop your next big idea. So please, massive round of applause for Giz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah, so welcome. Uh, my name is Giz Edwards and yep, that, that's, that's my name. Um, I thought I'd best get the, the elephant out of the room, you know, just talk about my name first. Um, <laughs> I was named after Gizmo the Gremlin from the film from the 80s. Uh, genuine, genuine story. The reason I was named after it is because um, when I was born, Apparently, I made a weird noise that was kind of like how Gizmo sounds, but I like to think of it like I was named Giz because I'm a little cute furry thing with big ears and quite handy with a bow and arrow, but whichever story you want to go with, that's it. And today I'm using um, Lucid Dreaming as a creative tool. Um, you can use Lucid Dreaming for anything from uh, product development to personal development, software development, uh, art, literature, uh, filmmaking. There's so many different things you can do with Lucid Dreaming and I'm going to talk to you about it briefly as well as talk to you how to do it. Um, but before I get into that, the narcissist in me has to tell you about myself. So I have been doing Lucid Dreaming for over 10 years. I think I started learning Lucid Dreaming when I was about 13 and I've been mainly doing YouTube videos uh, for the last 10 years especially um, looking into educational content, teaching people how to lucid dream. And recently, over the, like, the last probably five years, I've been teaching people one-on-one -on -one, as well as the videos you find on YouTube as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's quite an interesting thing. It's something people always talk about whenever I talk to them about something. This is the first time I'm talking at people, though, so... It's quite, a, quite an interesting experience, but not only do I do that, but I do some filming for companies and things. Like if, if you see me at an event, you'll probably see me with a camera. So if you do see me, just say hello. And that's pretty, pretty much it for about me. Um, yeah, so what is lucid dream? Uh, a lot of people get this confused with control of a dream, but it's not. So when I talk to some people about lucid dreaming, quite often they'll say that, oh, that lucid dreaming, that's controlling your dreams. But... It's not really. All you need to know is whether or not you're dreaming when you're actually in a dream. And that's it. It's just knowing that you're dreaming. Um, controlling dreams is a, what we call a layer of lucidity. So you have control as, like when you learn the skill of lucid dreaming, controls are just a different layer of lucidity. And the thing that makes lucid dreaming and dreams in general just fascinating is because, well, it feels real. Like everything we experience in waking life, senses and all sorts, um, that's created by the brain. So even though the spotlight is lovingly shining me right in the face, um, that light, I can only see that because my brain's created that image. So I can have healthy eyes and if my optic nerve is damaged, then I won't be able to see anything. So when you're in a lucid dream, say for example you're flying, what you expect the feeling of flight to be, that's how it feels. So you're soaring through the air. You feel the wind rippling against your face when you're like weaving in and out of buildings or zombies or aliens or whatever you want to dream about. It, you can feel that like that motion in your stomach, and it, it's incredible. Not only that, if you're flying, I don't know, past the sun, like I have done in a lucid dream, uh, you can feel the warmth of the sun hitting your skin, and it just feels real. If it didn't feel real, we would never know that we're in, no, we would always know that we're in a dream, but we don't because the feeling is so real that it kind of makes it feel like waking life. Um, lucid dreaming, as I said, isn't about controlling dreams, nor is it a vivid dream, nor is it daydreaming. I do get a lot of people saying to me, um, oh, I've had this vivid dream, uh, I think I had a lucid dream, and I say to them, well, did you know you were dreaming? And they go, no. And I said, well, you didn't. So, yeah. I, I don't know why people think daydreaming is lucid dreaming. I'm not sure where that came around, but that's a thing I've got to deal with. Like on a daily basis. 
Um, so this Kerno Dat event was supposed to be uh, 2nd of March or something, but because of the, the snowstorm that we had, it got postponed today. And as the planets would align, today is also International Lucid Dreaming Day. So happy Lucid Dreaming Day, everyone. Uh, the reason it's the 12th of April is because it was this day in 1975 where a researcher called Dr. Keith Hearn was the first person to scientifically measure a lucid dream in a lab. Um, what he did is he got a lucid dreamer called um, Alan Worsley and hooked him up with a load of EEG machines and just monitored him in a dream. Um, so you can see the period of REM, not the band, the, you know, the stage of sleep. So what he did was when he was asleep, he found that he was lucid dreaming. Uh, this is the dreamer himself. And he did eye signals because when you're in REM, your body's actually paralyzed. Um, we believe, although it's not confirmed, we believe that the reason your body is paralyzed is to prevent you from acting out your dreams. So if you were in a dream and you were running away from someone, um, Mickey Mouse, I don't know why Mickey Mouse. If you're running away from Mickey Mouse, um, you're not actually running in your bed. So it's a self-defense mechanism. But there are a few things that you can do that you can voluntarily control. So when you're in a dream, you can do some things like move your eyes and it's the exact same movement in your bed. So for example, if I was in a lucid dream and I looked to the left, I'd be looking left in my bed. If I was looking, well, I'd be looking left in my body. Um, but if I was looking right, I'd be looking right. So Keith Hearn and Alan Worsley came up with like a secret handshake type thing using eye signals. And when Alan Worsley found out that he was in a lucid dream, he did the eye signals. Keith Hearn then saw that he was in REM due to the EEG. He saw that he did the secret code of eye movements. And then when he woke um, Alan Worsley up, he said, did you have a lucid dream? He said, yes, I did. Did you do the eye signals? Yes, I did. So April 12th, 1975, it's a good, good kind of reminder for me and other lucid dreamers to, to kind of remind yourself that although a lot of people talk about lucid dreams and dreams in a very esoteric and just, you know, spirituality type thing, um, it's, it's science. It's based in science. And, and we've been able to replicate that experiment many times since. So, yeah, lucid dreaming day. So how do you do it? Um, yeah, this is, this is one of the techniques to learn how to lucid dream. It's the abridged version. I've kind of cut it down and minimized it so that it's easy to digest. But step one is you have to sleep more. And you know, oh no, poor me, I've got to sleep more. And the reason that you've got to sleep more is because when you're in um, REM, which is predominantly where we do our dreaming, uh, the sleep cycle the first sleep cycle you have, the REM period only lasts about five minutes. But as the nights go on, your REM gets longer and longer. So towards the early hours of the morning, your dream time is anywhere between half an hour and an hour long. So you could have potentially a lucid dream that lasts up to an hour. So sleep more, so you get that nice, rich, juicy REM stage of sleep. And then you have to record down your dreams. I was speaking to someone earlier about, like, I keep a dream journal. Um, it sounds a bit, you know, oh, keep a dream journal, but it's, you know, it's interesting even if you don't do lucid dreaming, the, how weird your dreams actually are. But yeah, you have to record your dreams in a dream journal. So at first you'll probably find that you only have like one or two lines of information. And then as you just develop your dream journal, you begin to recall more and more information. So you, you can have like two pages of A4 just on one dream. And as each dream, or each sleep cycle rather, is 90 minutes long, approximately, you can have loads and loads of dreams during the night. So then about three or four weeks later, you then analyze those dreams and you discover something called dream signs. And this is what makes this technique unique, because this is called reality check induced lucid dreaming. There's so many acronyms and initialisms, even I, I get sick to death of them, to be honest. There's hundreds. But yeah, dream sign is, it's a, uh, it's unique. It's unique to every individual. So it's a common theme that you dream. So when you analyze your dream journal and see and read through your dreams, you'll find that you dream about the same kind of things, like frequently. For me, I used to dream a lot about being in secondary school. I don't know why. It's just, I just did. Even though I was in college and university and I left university, I still, still dreamt of secondary school, which is odd. I also used to dream about my friend Dave from college. 
No idea. No idea. I'm sure Freud probably has something to say about that, but not me. Um, so <laughs> what, you, what you find is that when you see a dream sign, but whether it be Dave or you frequently see a unicorn or a bottle of water or a tennis racket or whatever it is, someone's dream sign is different to someone else's, yours is different to yours, yours is different to the Queen's and so on. But you have to perform a reality check when you see that in waking life. So let's take my friend Dave, for example. Every time I bumped into Dave in the street, I go, oh, um, I have to check if I'm dreaming. So you perform a reality check, and the way that you would do that is you would pinch your nose to see if you can breathe through it. Because as I mentioned before, you can do some things voluntarily. So moving your eyes in a dream, if you're looking left, you were looking left in bed. If you're looking right, you're looking right in bed. But your breathing's exactly the same. So if you take a long, deep breath, in a dream, you're actually doing exactly the same thing in bed. So when you pinch your nose in a dream and you try and breathe through it, you're not actually pinching your nose in bed. So you can breathe through your nose even though it's pinched when you're in a dream. And it is the weirdest thing, like, ever. It's the strangest feeling because, yeah, it, it really is. But the idea of that is that you kind of build it into a habit. So you continually do these reality checks to your dream signs and it becomes a habit. So then what you would do is when you see a dream sign in a dream, you perform that because it is a habit. And one day you'll be like, oh, I'm dreaming, which is great. There's also another thing that I kind of add into that, which is I always ask myself three questions and it kind of covers up all your bases just in case your reality check doesn't work or something. Then I always ask myself, where am I? I'm in the Falmouth Poly. What am I doing? I'm doing a talk about lucid dreaming to everyone. Where was I before this? I was in the bar drinking a drink. And that's what I do. So then when you do that in a dream, you'd be like, where am I? Uh, I'm in the crypts of Winterfell. <laughs> Bless you. Um, what am I doing? Uh, paying my respects to Lyanna Stark. And then where was I before that? I was uh, in the Mushroom Kingdom. Why not? So then. All of those things add up and you go, hang on, I must be in a dream. So why kind of that? Why kind of that? Why, why do the talk here? Well, lucid dreaming is universal, and as I mentioned, you can utilize it to loads of different things, but the that part of kind of that means development, art, and technology. So I'm going to try and fit it into that. So I will break down like how it can benefit all of those three different things. Um, yeah, click. So development. It's a very busy slide, this one. Um, I broke it down into kind of like four different things, like personal development, professional software, and product development. And as I said before, I think of lucid dreaming as a science. Um, a lot of people think of it as esoteric. But because I think of it as a science, I think that the lucid dream, or dreams in general, they're created out of some swampy mess of subconscious and unconscious thoughts. So you're not actually in control of what is being built around you unless you're lucid enough and have enough consciousness in there. But because it's my subconscious, like say for example product development, if you want to make an idea for a product, you're in a lucid dream. You can manifest a character who is technically a part of your, yourself, your subconscious, and you can just backwards and forwards your product development. Like if you want to build something, you can just keep asking each other questions and just bounce off each other. And even down to logos. If you want to make a logo and you've kind of got a good idea of what you want, just go to a printer, press print. It works. It, it sounds mental, but it, it does work. And you can print and it will come out and you'll be like, oh, I don't like that. And then you scroll it up and you print again and you go, oh, I do like that. As long as you can remember that when you wake up. Happy days. Personal development is its a long one to talk about. I, I won't break it down too much, but there's it's endless, literally. It's endless for personal development. Say, for example, I've got a friend called Max. Uh, he has a lot of mental health issues. He has uh, psychosis, and he uses lucid dreaming to talk to the voices that he hears. And he tries to help his mental illnesses, or help try and like, cope with them, I suppose, through lucid dreaming. So he can hear a voice in waking life, and I think he's got a voice called Darren. But then when he's in a lucid dream, he can actually speak to Darren and talk to him and ask him, like, what are you doing? Like, why, why, why am I hearing you? Uh, there's other things that you can do, like battle phobias and nightmares. Um, if you are afraid of spiders, 
then you can just uh, inundate yourself with spiders, just walk into a, a layer of spiders. I don't know if that's the correct term, but you can just, you know, there's loads of things. Professional development, say for example, you're doing a talk in front of loads of people and you're nervous. Just go to the Sydney Opera House, go to, um, I don't know, Madison Square Garden, see how many thousands of people there are and just practice your speech in front of them. You can also do that for, um, if you've got to talk to your boss about something and you need a run up and you don't think, oh, just thinking about it in waking life, you're like, oh, I don't know if that's, you know, that's not realistic enough. Go into Lucid Dream and, you know, just speak to him. It helps, it really does help. And software development, this is probably something that a lot of you have like, how? Well, I learned a term the other day called rubber duck. I don't know if, yeah, I see some people nodding. Um, I didn't know that was a thing. I thought they were talking mental talk to me, but no, it's a thing where you bounce an idea off someone else. Kind of similar to the product development where you can go into a dream, and again, because it's all part of your subconscious, you can go to a computer, you think about the code, maybe you've got a problem with some of the code and you don't know where the problem is. Just go to the computer, type in your code, or maybe it's already there, and the computer can help you. Or you can talk to someone who knows a little bit more about you, about the coding, but it is you. It's, it gets very weird and, you know, difficult to talk about. But, yeah, you can bounce ideas off other people, but it's still you. Because you've got to ima imagine that somewhere in your brain is every memory, everything you've ever learned. You can't access it in waking life because you just don't have the conscious power to do it. But in a dream, everything is there. You can relive a memory. You can, you can uh, think about something that you learned in the past. It's just so many, so many different things. So that's the development side of it. Art, limitless. <coughs> I put four. But yeah, limitless possibilities. Uh, books, if you're a writer, um, you can use Lucid Dreaming to help you make a plot line or develop some story or develop some characters. I know for a fact that Mary Shelley um, wrote Frankenstein and the idea of Frankenstein came to her in a dream. Now imagine that Mary Shelley could do Lucid Dreaming. How would the characters in her Lucid Dream, how would they communicate to each other? Would it be any different from the book that she wrote now? And that was the first ever science fiction novel. I think. I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's right. The same with movies. Um, movies, you can, you, if you're a director, you can direct and move the, the camera to wherever part you want. You can go on a set, or if you want to see your film in its completed state before you've even made it, just watch it on a laptop or, you know, do something like that. Again, with movies and, say, you're a script writer, you can get your characters together and see how they will interact with each other. It's very interesting because You've created the characters, they're in there somewhere. You don't know how they're going to communicate to each other. So what happens is, I don't know, anyone's guess. Uh, paintings, this is a really, really cool one. Um, I've got a friend called Daniel. Uh, he used to be a painter before he became not that Daniel. <laughs> I've got a, a different friend called Daniel. And he used to be a painter. And he learned how to lucid dream to help him do paintings. He's a lucid dream and researcher now, very knowledgeable guy, and he has probably, I would say, the best book ever about lucid dreaming that I've ever read. Uh, but what he used to do is, when he would finish a painting and he would have a lucid dream, he would actually go to an art gallery with his painting up on the wall, and then what he would do is he would step into the painting, and then he would kind of be in the world of the painting, and then he would go around, look at a different angle, and then he'd wake up, and then he would paint what he saw. So he had a collection of paintings that were all existent in the same painting world. So that's, that's it blew my mind when I, when I read that. That was actually in his book, he was talking about that. Uh, more, I don't know why I wrote more when I could just wrote music, because that's what I'm talking about. But <laughs> music, when I started learning lucid dreaming, I was in a few bands, and I was learning how to play the guitar, and what I would do is, in the lucid dream, I would practice guitar. Because I don't know how many of you are aware of how we learn things, but when we learn something new, 
um, we go through different stages of learning and the first one is cognitive learning which is where your brain will try and create neural pathways for you to learn it so quickly so you can you can get on to the next stage of, of learning and research has shown that if you think about doing something it's very similar to actually doing it when you're first starting it so I remember reading a lab report about um, bodybuilders they had two groups of untrained people they got one group to do um, weightlifting in waking life like normal just with barbells and stuff and they got another group to do thinking about weightlifting I know which group I would prefer but they found that initially the level of strength that they had rose at the same rate and that's because when you're doing weightlifting you get like what's known as uh, uh, new gains or something, new, new kind of gains or something like that where when you're lifting a, a weight your, your brain goes oh we actually we, we actually need to use our muscles so our brain will actually send signals to our muscles saying we need more muscle movement and it doesn't matter if you're thinking about that and it doesn't matter if you're actually doing it your brain will think oh I need to move more muscles or more muscle fibers rather so they improved in strength initially at first so and then obviously the, the team that was actually doing the weightlifting and actually putting the effort in, they did gain strength after that. But it's still very interesting. Um, but yeah, music, as I said, I was learning guitar. I learned how to play guitar quite quickly because of me practicing in the dream. And a lot of people um, use lucid dreaming to help them create music. I know I've composed music in a dream. I know that um, Paul McCartney has composed music in a dream. Uh, he actually wrote yesterday, um, but it came to him in a dream, and he thought that, oh, that can't be right, that, that has to be actually a song that I've just dreamt about. And he asked his friends and his family, and they said, never heard of it before. So that's how he came up with that song. And technology, this one's a bit interesting, um, because I like virtual reality, I like the idea of virtual reality, um, but I think the technology if we somehow incorporate that into the same kind of senses that you have for lucid dreaming, it will, it will I don't know, I don't know, but virtual reality, a lot of people will compare lucid dreaming to the matrix. I know when I'm trying to explain someone about a lucid dream, I kind of refer to it as the matrix. So people will be in the matrix and then they realize they're in the matrix, and so they realize they're in a dream, and then they can do whatever they want. But it's a virtual reality it's being created and you are interacting with the dream world you're created um, you're interacting with the matrix so i think there could be some relationship between virtual reality and dreaming somehow i know oh gosh this must be 10 20 years ago they came up with um, this technology in which they they hooked someone up to an eeg again and then they showed them a series of images with thousands of images and they um, they would uh, link the image to the way that the brain fires in motor neurons because of that image then they go to the next one and then they would link that and then they would go to that one and link that so then what this computer had was a sequence of images and a sequence of brain waves and how the brain fires so then all the the computer would pick what they were thinking of and that was 10 15 20 years ago i don't know what it's like now but i think that if we could further that technology into something like it's like everyone wants to record their dreams. Imagine waking up and you've got like a USB drive and you just plug it into the computer and see your, your dreams. I hope, I mean, it's way past my knowledge, but I hope in the future that's, that's possible. Electrical engineering. Um, I, to be honest, I struggled a little bit with this one, um, but I think if we think of it as like, say for example, you're Tony Stark, Bear with me. Um, you're, you're a genius or you're very good at what you do. I say he's very good at electrical engineering. Um, if he needs to come up with an idea, but he doesn't have the, the capacity to think about it properly, he can actually go into a dream, into a lucid dream, and he'll be able to, um, again, with the rubber duck thing, uh, able to try and talk to someone about the, the problem. And maybe you can come up with the next biggest thing. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. But, yeah, that's... There's something there. I, again, uh, I'm, this isn't my field of knowledge with 
uh, technology, but I think someone with with the knowledge of being able to do virtual reality or electrical engineering or something similar you can think about that. Another quite interesting point actually is um, again something coming to someone in a dream. Einstein when he came up with his theory of relativity the initial thought actually occurred to him in a dream. He's a genius or he was a genius but he just imagine what he could have achieved if he was lucid and he was able to communicate with himself. He came up with the idea of theory of relativity partly because of a dream. Now imagine what he could have achieved if he knew that he was in a dream and he could communicate to himself. I, I just wish. Imagine Tesla. What, what would he have come up with if he could talk to himself and bounce ideas off? Um, also in a dream, the structure of an atom, the person who came up with the structure of the atom or visualized the structure of the atom, that came to him in a dream. The invention of the eye of the needle, that came to someone in a dream. Just imagine the possibilities. It's endless. So there's some recommendations there. Uh, YouTube. I, as I said, I've, I've, I'm a YouTuber. I've been doing YouTube for 10 plus years. I think next week I'll have over 50,000 subscribers or something. So YouTube is my, my main go-to place when it comes to learning about lucid dreaming and the community itself. So I, as you see there, I've Team Lucid Dream. I came up with the idea of Team Lucid Dream, which was a group of people who all like teaching people lucid dreaming pulling together your ideas and the way you think, making scripts and coming up with ideas and podcasts and live streams and stuff. And I was the, the head of it and there was a few writers that I got involved and presenters that we got involved. And we managed to do, I think it was five videos a week for a year and a bit or something like that. I can't really remember the exact, but we're currently writing and preparing for season two. So watch that space. And we've got me. I've got over 300 videos all about lucid dreaming, sleep, sleep cycles, sleep deprivation. I did my dissertation on sleep deprivation at uni. So it was a painful, painful time. Um, but yeah, I, I have a lot of videos. Lucid Guide, that chap that I was talking about who could step into his paintings, that's him. His YouTube channel is Lucid Guide. And he also wrote the book that you can see there, Are You Dreaming? Daniel Love. Um, the best book I've ever read about lucid dreaming, so I highly recommend that. Uh, he hasn't got that many videos, but he is so knowledgeable about lucid dreaming that he puts, he puts so much time and effort into it. It's incredible. And we've got Space Time Badass, or James as his parents probably call him. But again, he, he talks about lucid dreaming like I do from a very scientific point, but he is a self-admitted guinea pig of lucid dreaming supplements, of lucid dreaming um, herbs and things, not that type of herb, but um, if you've got like the African dream route, for example, he, he'll have that and he'll document his, his, uh, his experience with that and everything. There's lucid dreaming herbs like Kalia Sakatachichi, which took me a long time to learn how to pronounce, but yeah, he'll, he'll take that as well. And there's a, a newcomer onto the, the scene called Tifero or Matt. Again, lots of videos about lucid dreaming, uh, from beginner to intermediate to advanced, kind of like myself. Uh, he and I probably post the most on YouTube. I post a video every other day. Um, Tiffero probably does similar to that. But if I haven't spoken about something or made a video about lucid dreaming, a specific thing, he has. And if he hasn't, I have. Uh, we've probably covered everything. Um, you see there it says uh, Dr. Stephen Burge's book, Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming. That's what Lucid Dreamers will refer to as the Lucid Dreaming Bible. Um, it was written by Stephen LeBurge and Howard Rheingold, I believe. But as good as that book is, and it is a very good book, I still recommend Are You Dreaming? And then there's lucidsource.net. That's my friend. He's called Geo. And he, again, is a very, I, I've got some nice friends, I think, and they're all quite smart people. He's a smart guy who talks about. Um, lucid dreaming and he has some great resources on there including his own guides to lucid dreaming as well and he's also the lead writer of team lucid dream which helps where you can find me w double w full stop youtube.com forward slash giz edwards and there's twitter i'm pretty much at giz edwards at everything and there's my email and that is not the white hand of sour man that is the six fingers of my logo so yeah that's pretty much it for me um, any questions? Yes? Did you lose it? No.
No, I should have and I could have, but when you're in a lucid dream, even though you have like goals and stuff that you can set before you go into a lucid dream, which is a technique that you know is very, it's called dream incubation. Um, sometimes when you plan something and you go into the dream, you just want to fly or do something like that. So I, I remember I had a, an experience in which I was, I wanted to ask my, my subconscious uh, a question, like where I wanted to be in life, what I want to do. And I thought, yeah, I can ask that to myself. So when I was in the dream, I saw my dog, my old dog that passed away a few years ago, and I thought, I could take you for a walk instead. So that's what I did. So even though you have a plan and an idea of what you want to do, and a checklist sometimes, it doesn't always stick. Sorry? Yeah, I did. I took them both for a walk, and uh, it was nice because I, I, they they went quite quick. One of them had like tumors in his throat or something, and, and we never got a chance to say goodbye. But it was just a nice opportunity for me to have that cathartic release of just uh, take the dogs for a walk. They were lovely in a the dream. They were a pain in the neck in waking life. Like seriously, oh, Marley. Just if you've seen the film Marley and Me, he actually had a dog called Marley, and he was worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a really common thing. That's called a hypnic jerk. It's um, it's when you're in between waking waking stage and the first stage of sleep cycles. Um, you're very light stage sleep. So any thin that like flies at you in a dream you will wake up in fact when you're in a lucid dream often beginners will find that when they have their first lucid dream like myself when I had my first lucid dream you go oh my god this is a dream and because you get so excited you actually prematurely wake up and it's called layer one because it's so universally recognized that it is a common occurrence so yeah yes I have yep. yeah, uh, so Yeah, yeah. And the journal we can write. Yep. So, is there possibly an element of self-fulfilling prophecy in there? Yep. Yeah, um, writing the journal, we use that more steering and that we might have. Yeah, um, I, I know what you mean. Um, I made a video a couple of days ago about that, actually, so quite a good question. But it was about if you have a relative or something that's passed away, and you need, like similar to my dogs, you want to have a chance to say goodbye, you can create a, a projection of your subconscious about that person. So a lot of people who look at lucid dreaming as like the esoteric side of things, they will say that, uh, oh, that's actually your, your long lost relative who has passed away um, and he's actually speaking to you. I think it's just a projection of that. But I caution that not to do it because if that dream character, that projection says something nasty, you can actually taint the image of that person that you have and what will happen then potentially is that because that happened you're thinking about it the more you think about it the more likely it is to occur there's this thing called day residue with lucid dreaming which is when uh, something in your day will happen and then when you're in a dream um, you're more likely to see it so for example if you go to hospital in waking life um, you're more likely to dream about a hospital or a doctor or the doctor or you know something similar um, so yeah it's, it's definitely you can be self-fulfilling Yeah, I, I understand. Um, I don't know if you remember, I mentioned dream incubation, which is where you think of an idea before you go to sleep, and you're more likely to dream of that idea. So if you write a, a list of goals of stuff that you want to do, say electrical engineering, you've got a thing that you want to do, um, you can actually incubate that idea, and the chances of it happening in the dream just increase. And because it's the last thing you thought of, usually, not always, but usually you 
you think, oh, I'm thinking, I just thought about that in bed, that I must be in a dream. So it bypasses that. I don't know how good we are for time. <laughs> Tony gave me the, the cut. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much to Yiz. Oh.